Co-founders of Painted Jacket. Here they are. And newlyweds Hi. as well. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. And hello, everyone. Uh, everyone's everyone's piling in. We've got I think we've got here we go. Lissa and Claire and Sam and Io and Jeevan and Bianca. They're all saying hi already. So um now I can see here you've so you've your second name is now painter. Is this true? <laughs> yeah. It seemed like well. the fairest way. <laughs> I mean that is commitment to the to the brand, huh? <laughs> But let, let's go back to the start of this story, uh, Becky and Hugh. Like, was it, did you, were you, you know, what came first? Was it, was it you got together as a couple or was the idea of the business formed first? How did it all begin? Yeah, well, the, the, it brought, everything happened very quickly. <laughs> we basically met then within three months of meeting. Um, we'd kind of started the business together yeah it's an amazing way to get to know each other pretty quickly <laughs> yeah and that's, that's quite intense you we need to sit you down with flash pack i don't know if you know those no. uh, uh yeah rada and lee because they did it for it was first date and rada pitched lee no uh, the idea of flash pack wow that and he was the first date in 50 that didn't run away oh wow. my god so there you go. Now, I said I would do some warm-up questions before we get into the story properly. So this is very simple. Either or, shout out, uh, and we'll see how how you both respond. So here we go. Mornings or evenings? Mornings. Mornings. Hot or cold? Hot. Hot, yeah. Tea or coffee? Coffee. coffee. Oh, God. Oh, wow, you really are on, online. Here we go. Uh, Canva and or Photoshop? Photoshop. Yeah. Same. We did start using Canva a lot. Hardcore <laughs> graphics, next level. Mm. Uh, rent or resell? Oh, in terms of fashion, I was like, oh, renting is mm. our only option for the foreseeable. <laughs> yeah. um, rent resell. or resell? Uh, resell. resell. Yeah, however you want to interpret it. Um, <laughs> bootstrap or VC? Bootstrap. bootstrap. Uh, collars or cuffs? Mm, collars. collars. Yeah. I mean, that, that's not an easy question to answer in your world, but yes, collars. Okay. Um, and finally, are you hopeful or mopeful? Very hopeful. Hopeful. Good. Mopeful doesn't, it's not, it's not a real <laughs> word, so we're not allowed to answer that. Good. You pass that test. <laughs> a little bit of differentiation. Mopeful, this interview would be just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd be like, right, we've got a work cut out here. Yeah. So so let's go back to that story. So you so within three months, the idea was born. And what, what how did it evolve from? You know what was it? What were you looking at? We how did it become a first version? So, I'd been collecting jackets for a while, um, and you were working at a denim factory and product and yeah, a and company called so. Hyatt Denim in West Wales. Oh, you were at Hyatt Denim. Yeah, oh. I was there for four and a half years. Um, so I'd take all the scrap fabric, all the really amazing Japanese denim, and just yeah. take it home and just make jackets with them, and like. This is the very first one. This is before we met as well. Yeah. And you did walk so into the bar this on this one. Okay. <laughs> um, it's it's a for small... your nephew, didn't it? Yeah. yeah. Bring it. Bring it back. Bring it back, Hugh. So okay. tell, talk us through. This was your first attempt at making a jacket. Yeah, I love everything Japanese. Yeah. Um, so this is what they call a kind of. It looks like a kimono. Yeah. It's basically a Japanese workwear jacket called a oh, naragi. Right. Um, so I started there. And then when we met, um, I kind of like told Becky about this thing about making jackets. I was like, why aren't you doing any more? That sounds amazing. Yeah. Um, and I think work had just been really busy for you. Yeah. yeah so it's like just it's kind of like side projects. projects. Yeah. They get put to a side and it's like, um, then we met. I just found it really exciting. And I was like, well, that seems like a great project. Um, we were long distance and it was, I, I don't know, it was, it was an exciting way to get to know each other. I'd yeah. studied textiles. Um, okay. We met on a branding workshop. So we had a we had a lot in common and we both wanted to do something of our own. Um, and we thought at least, well, you had one really special jacket, didn't you? Because yeah. you bought quite a few and a great way to make a pattern and to figure out how to make something is by taking it apart. And so you'd taken loads apart. But there was one that you just didn't want to take apart because the fit was so good. And it's scary when you're learning because if you take apart the 
the thing that works so well and you can't put it back together again. Um, you've lost the essence of what was so great about it. So you'd left you'd, you'd left one and you'd bought it with you on that date in North Wales. Yeah. And all my family tried it on and it just looked great on everyone. And so I took it back and we figured out. And your out, family were like, he's a keeper. He's made a jacket. Yeah. He's, 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 he's got a great jacket He's collection. a keeper and that jacket's great. <laughs> but that was basically yeah. the last thing I was wearing right jacket. <laughs> yeah. So Becky took it back to London with her and I was like, I think cool. the, the next weekend we went on a day trip on a on a Saturday to go meet this old guy who is a retired pattern maker from Burberry um, and got the train out to meet him and we were sat in his living room with this jacket figuring out how do we make our first pattern mm. and it was it was just like week by week we'd come together at the weekends because we we're both working full time and, and we're 200 just, miles apart yeah and we just figure out like a little bit more about how to make a great jacket and also mm how to go about building a brand we and in that whole thing on instagram we didn't yeah didn't it's kind of like will this be a brand not sure but let's yeah. document it anyway because we wish that you could see kind of the like the, the, the behind the scenes of brands being built like we enjoy seeing that it's like the best parts of like the planet earth series mm -hmm. is the last 10 minutes where they show you how it was yes. filmed so it's like we love that stuff so why not share that anyway wherever it, this thing may come or yeah. become so in that as you did that and as you started having these meetings and weekends around design um mm. we we was the motivation anything other than passion for the like cr the creative like creating something that potentially had value to someone or were you thinking more of like oh i'd love to build a business and run off into the sunset together and build like, a <laughs> successful brand in three years time would be interviewed on every podcast and startup <laughs> event where, where were your motivations at that moment oh i think it's curiosity there were so it's, many it was just curiosity about how a business works mm -hmm. how to go about finding a factory mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um we were long distance and doing something together felt like one way that we might end up in the same city so there was like personal motivations to it as well that were totally not like massive business um ambitions um I think what else we did we did want to make a brand we, we, but I think we like we started this Instagram account with it was very much building in public that like we were sharing yeah, everything DIY. that went wrong every decision we made even before we had our own samples like the vintage jackets we were looking at for inspiration and getting people to vote on things and really have their say and it was it was all very involved and um people at that point were like oh if you ever actually make this jacket commercially then we would i would love one and so this was the community at the beginning of the community building and when you say get people to vote <coughs> how did you get those people onto the instagram in the first place were you deliberately using hashtags following other um well, fashion Becky accounts would find somebody and she'd like we'd be in conversation next thing she has their phone going on their instagram <laughs> account and saying follow <laughs> <laughs> only if they showed interest. Yeah, only if they showed interest. No, that wasn't. It, it mainly came from like it's us a, personally talking about it. Yeah, and then the friends and family. It's very slow. Yeah. Yeah. We, so, what period of time are we talking for this sort of initial? Probably a build? year. A year. Yeah. A good yeah. year. Yeah. We. I think we figured out that if we were going to design something that we were really, really happy with, and put it up for sale on the day that we were finally comfortable with every detail, no one would no one would care no one would right. trust us that that would be a good a good piece they wouldn't know enough about it There's, it would be far too late so we kind of thought well if we are ever going to sell this then we should be talking about it for a really long time so that people mm. can build an affinity with what we're doing be involved and definitely trust because we make to order as well so trust is a huge element to what we do it's so fascinating to hear that sort of mix of, of imposter syndrome, which we all have a little bit, but also that kind of like recognition and quite mature awareness of the fact that if you put something out there quickly on day one, that's supposed to be a quality premium product, it's going to be very hard to, to yeah. get people on board with. So when you yeah. say vote, get get people to vote on things, what sort of things were you asking? There's colors, maybe some styles. Yeah, it was it's pockets, pocket shapes. Should the pockets have a flap? Would you prefer a corrosion up button or a metal button? Should it be unisex? Yeah. You know, it, it's all sorts. It, it's just trying to get people involved. Fabrics. Trying to get them engaged, like in ways that other brands potentially don't. And was it genuinely helpful to the development of the jacket and the product? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we took everything and just put like, uh, it, 
use it. And I think that, that was the nice part because when like still maybe like two years in, we were still asking people for, for like voting these colors that we should make. Mm. And there's one we'd kind of ruled out and then we saw the votes come in and thought, Oops. okay, that, this, that's definitely gonna happen. Let's just bring that in. And it, it's just nice to be able to show people Actually, we do, we do listen facade, to that. Yeah. You're not just doing yeah. it for marketing purpose. You're actually going, okay, yeah, we should definitely do that. Yeah. yeah, fantastic. And then take us from that sort of Instagram community build to the first, you know, the first sale of the first jacket. What did you do to get to that point? And how did you decide, like, how you were going to try and sell it? So it got to the point where, as Becky mentioned, the people said, oh, where can I, when can I get one? Or where can I get one? Mm. And that's at the point where we just thought, okay, if this is going to become a brand if this, or a business, um, how are we going to set it up? Because having worked in the clothing industry, you know, it's like the second biggest polluting industry in the world. There's a huge waste problem um, when it comes to like overproduction. And... It was the most off-putting thing to even considering starting yeah. another brand. The impact side of it. Why do we want to yeah. add to this mess? And if yeah. we are going to start a brand, we want to do it in a completely different way. Yeah. So that whole year, not only were we getting our product right, but we were figuring out the intricacies of how the business model would work and mm. how we could do things in a better way. Yeah. And it basically came to the thing of what if we did the absolute opposite of everybody else? Instead of having more and more collections always available, like uh, next day delivery, what if we went the complete opposite and did maybe three jackets a year? Mm and at that time we only had one yeah <laughs> so we didn't have the next two so like that'd be hyper growth yeah yeah oh yeah <laughs> like what if we did three and each one was made to order so they'd be ready and like after you uh, pre-order yours it's ready in about eight to ten weeks um it's a kind of an extreme like like uh, variation of the current model um it also came up because we I've always wanted an independently owned business. Um, we would both make terrible employees and we really like working for ourselves and we like to have control over what we're building. And at that time, we didn't really know what we were building. So we definitely didn't want to give any of the control away. Um, so we were working full time to kind of save up and save up and put all of our savings that we could into painting. And I think we both put just under £5,000 each at the beginning, yeah. didn't we? Okay. And that's not nothing like enough to buy your fabric and your manufacturing it doesn't touch the surface. Um, so we knew that we had to make to order and we had to sell before we made and had to pay our, our manufacturers. So that was a kind of constraint on us that was really decided for us. And then we, we weren't actually planning. We, we, so on our first launch day, it was on a Saturday morning at 9 a.m. Because we were both still, I was living in London, he was in Wales. So it was the time that we were together and it gave us enough time on the Friday night to make sure the website was working. It was like really much, as much because of that as anything. Um, and we thought we'll just, we'll open the website and we know we've bought enough fabric for 300 pieces. Because that's like, the minimum order with the factories in Portugal. Yeah, right. we didn't do any less than that, which seemed frightening yeah um, and what sort of what sort of was this covered by your ten thousand pounds or no 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 oh, so you, this was from your pre-orders that you had to do oh, it was just okay. fabric yeah 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 okay. um and so yeah we thought well we'll we'll keep the website open for a week and then hopefully by that time we might have sold 150 was our guess mm -hmm. we thought mm -hmm. at that point we can afford then to place the, the order for the 300 pieces and we'll sell whatever else later. We'll know the size splits and the quantities and um, 14 minutes after we put them online, they'd all sold out. So we were absolutely baffled. We didn't know what to do with ourselves for the rest of the weekend. <laughs> no, I bet you didn't. But, no. but just, to, just to go through the process, um, so, mm -hmm. so you did the year-long community build on Instagram. What sort yeah. of numbers of followers and how much engagement did you have at that point? I think about three thousand followers, but it might have been yeah. a lot less. It could have been less, half of that. No, yeah, it was between two and three thousand. Do you reckon? Yeah, yeah. We... Yeah, call, according to the stats about you, here you go. Oh yeah, you had two and a half thousand people signed up for your wait list for the first jacket. So does that mean that they had yeah. they were on an email list or were they just followers on Instagram? That was an email list. Yeah, yeah. Okay. and the, and the wait list was also still being added to post 
post launch, if you like. So if someone missed out on that Saturday and they were signing up to say, I want one if there's a return and these are my my details and my size and my color choices. So, so you needed was... about 150 from two and a half thousand to convert. Yeah. 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 And 300 did. And then we were sold out because our fabric was made to order. So we couldn't make any more. So. It takes about 12 weeks to make the fabric. So yeah. people are like, they sold out. They sold out. Like, how can I get not, How can I get one? Like, why did you just make more? It's like, well, we can't. That process that's, that's, started that's, a while ago. This, that, this I, is I, where I think the, you know, the transparency in your exclusivity is like, it, it sounds, to, I'm sure from your point of view, it sounds very straightforward because it's your reality. Like, mm. we could yeah, only so have. So for most people sitting online watching any kind of sale of anything, it's like, well, no, of course they've got more stock. They can get more stock if they want. But when mm. you're actually communicating over and over again, no, that's it. Yeah. People, like, I think that's probably. Did you find that's the moment you you built sort of even more loyalty and anticipation? Yeah. I think it was actually batch two. Yeah. Okay. Because that was when we thought, okay, um, that was maybe six months later. Yeah. Launched batch May two. And um, that one sold out in three minutes. And, and we were so scared whether it would yeah. sell out at all because on the first the one, second one, one. In the family and then you're like, who's going to turn up for well, another jacket? Want one. And then that's all in three <laughs> minutes and we had so much backlash. It was actually really difficult because people yeah. were quite vicious because they, they think they thought it was kind of a marketing thing and a hype thing. Mm. And we're like, whoa, we weren't, didn't think we could sell 300. So they're Again. like, why didn't you make so many more? Um, wow. So it because it, you're learning every time and you've got no other data other than that one day back in May to base things off. Yeah. Um, but isn't that crazy that people funny. got upset about mm. not getting the jacket at the people making the jacket? Yeah. That's, that's wild. We spent the entire weekend recording because we had quite a lot of angry DMs and emails. We spent the whole weekend recording videos being like, hey, Matt, really sorry. Um, just wanted to explain why we can't just make more because the fabric, blah, blah, blah. And yeah. like, and people were amazing it was actually such a lesson it turned so many people around yeah like kind of facing up to something when it's not good not just when it is good mm -hmm. it was a really good lesson or actually. ignoring it is uh... lucky it's then. such an opposite experience that i think there's probably lots of founders or certainly from my point of view where you're dealing with fortunately it hasn't happened too often but where you're dealing with unhappy customers who've bought something yeah you're trying to explain either refund or explain why you know their expectations haven't been matched or whatever and yours yeah. is the other way around. And I was thinking everyone's yeah. still sitting here going, I'd much rather be in that situation. But it sounds like that was, you know, you, you what did it make you think in that moment? Were you thinking, oh, we have to change our model or we have to, or were you just thinking, wow, we can sell loads of this easily over and over again? Um, no, I think we've always been on the, we've never thought, oh, this is easy. This we can do it over and over again. We've Our customers have actually always come to us and said, guys, you need to have more confidence in being able to sell these jackets. It's like, it, they, they just, we've always been just super honest about like doing it. We'd like, we don't want to go from 300 to like 30,000 or something like that. <laughs> That'd be insane. Um, and it would be insane because of, because of what? Because of the pressure it would put on you both as a, as a, founding team or or the environmental impact and the sustainability side or just like your motivations to go that big what where where do you feel that pressure to not scale fast i think um, after batch two actually that was the first time we realized that we did need to increase the batch size and um, because we'd mm -hmm. made 300 and then 300 again and then when we realized that there was a lot more demand we we then increased to 500 for batch three and so that we do we do respond to the demand whether it's the style that we're making or um, the appetite for the previous one yeah. um, and that will inform the decisions we make on the size of the next one um, but I think for a business like ours where the main purpose is to not make any waste then to make suddenly so many would be completely counterintuitive yeah. um, and we'd be in we'd be in a tricky situation we'd so we we can't do it morally for that reason. Yeah, and we've never had like the dream of like let, let's make this into a really big thing. It's like we love working with like small family run factories. Um, one of them like has fourteen people, and that's including the accounting and everything. <laughs> and if we went to them and said, right, we're going to double or quadruple our order size, they'd fire us as a client. They can't. 
because because mm. they, they can only make a certain amount at a certain like they don't have timers or anything or counting uh, like clock like uh, calculators on their sewing machines they may, they take as long as they, they need to, be able to make it properly mm. and like to be able to do everything within you know the eight to ten weeks delivery and keep it exactly how we want it's like we're, we're in like a really nice place where if we went and did it much bigger you had to go to a much bigger factory where it's much more transactional in that kind of factory where we learn a lot from our factories at the moment and they learn from us and we learn to work together it's like it's more like Mm -hmm. a it's a really good relationship um because you're talking with like the decision makers and everywhere in the factory where otherwise we'd be like these tiny fish in this big pond going Mm -hmm. Will you make our jackets? And yeah, and, then, and it's a difference between a slow and a fast fashion business, right? Yeah. Um, I guess the business sort of critique of s- slow fashion is that well, you're going to get copied, and you know, people when people can see the demand, mm-hmm. someone says, "Come on, rip off your designs," and yeah. off they go, and and then that's going to kill you eventually. So, what has that happened, and is that a threat? That's it's definitely a threat. Yeah, it's definitely a threat. It hasn't happened. Um, touch wood in a in a big fashion way because there's there's so many high street brands that are so guilty of ripping off important products to a lot a lot of small businesses and oh, misguided oh, sorry for saying that there's just so many um, yeah. it almost feels like it will inevitably happen and the things that have happened so far are actually been small businesses I think seeing seeing how we do things and thinking it looks quite easy and yeah. so taking too much of the things that are ultimately ours, perhaps workwear launching it in a batch of 300 on a Saturday morning at 9 a.m. <laughs> has happened a frightening amount of times. It's quite an odd because we didn't make those decisions because there was any magic formula for a Saturday morning on a workwear jacket. It's, um, and it's almost mm. like the worst the worst time to launch anything. Our customers tell us they're out with their kids at Play football. football. <laughs> um, and all of these are the reasons. Um, which would mean they don't want to buy a jacket on a Saturday. It almost reminds me when I was trying to buy Glastonbury tickets like 15 years ago, and I yeah. went into the office on a Saturday morning early <laughs> and turned on 10, you know, 10 old school monitors to like get them all like firing in the same, get the tickets. Um, so I want to yeah. talk, dive into the brand with you and the story of that and how you've built it. But before I do, um, Lisa's asking, Lisa from Noir Velocity, I hope to have said that right. Um, how did you decide on pricing? Was it the conventional fashion retail markup? No, we went no, for quite a not. direct, direct um, consumer kind of markup, a lot yeah. less than traditional retail, especially a lot less than luxury. Yeah, because we didn't have to sell it to, I don't know, Mr. Porter. We didn't have to, and there's the two of us. Yeah. It's like we were trying to build something smaller that actually, when a customer received the jacket, they felt that they had really good value. Yeah. yeah. We wanted something that ultimately we felt we could afford. Mm-hmm. Um we know it is it's it's more expensive than high street that's undeniable but it's because we work with really really good quality ingredients and so we have to charge a premium and we never discount our factories or ask them how can we make this cheaper we understand that they're giving us their best price and we work with that um we i think we're we're really quite scrappy in a lot of the ways we do things on the Mm -hmm. business side um, in keeping our costs super, super lean. So we didn't get a studio until like the end of lockdown and everything was working yeah. from home. And it was the two of us until three months ago. And now we have some help on a part-time basis and by one fantastic woman. Like we um, have, we spent £34 on Facebook ads for yeah. batch one. We were very, so we, we, were very we, we, we started and went, actually, you can't be bothered to do you, this. You do not need to do paid marketing, that's for sure. There's <laughs> nothing <laughs> out, coming out of that budget. Yeah. Um, that's so nothing in terms that of customers are paying for it. It's just like, no, they shouldn't be paying for that. Yeah. So if anyone does get their hands on a painted jacket or has one now, like Andy, they will know that they, you'll, you know, the branding, the logo, unlike, you know, the cap you're wearing tonight, Hugh, is not, you can't see it. <laughs> so tell us a bit about that because so much of fashion is about like the, the, the name, right? And labeling and stamping. You've got the garment, obviously. So tell mm-hmm. us how about the design and how you fitted the brand into the design and the, you know, what you wrote on the collar and so on to, to engage your customers? So it kind of stems from a few places. Like one, we don't wear clothes except for my hat that has NY on it. Like we don't wear anything with labels on, so like with logos on. So why would we design something with that? It feels short term. Yeah. Um, and it feels like a shortcut. Um, we would rather 
instead of putting a big brand name on something, we'd rather have to consider all of the details. So mm. what make, might make that a special piece for someone? It's probably harder to sell something, imagine, without a logo on it. Yeah. Because people might go, oh, I'm buying because of the name, but no one else can see the name on the outside. So what's the social value in this? Because as Becky said, if you buy something with a logo on it on the outside, it's what a shortcut value. for someone to say, I'm wearing this, you can see that, and therefore I belong to this group of people. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or you, so or I, sh you, I think I should belong to this group of people. Um, and we were like, actually, we'd much we rather don't. make classic pieces yeah. that are relevant this year as much as they are in 10 years. So, but we have more fun on the inside of the jacket, yeah. which is for the wearer. So, on our limited edition labels, so our care labels, that's where we have fun, but that's not for everyone. It's just for like the person who's bought a jacket. Yeah. And so you had that phrase, take care of yourself, um, written mm -hmm. into the back. Tell us about that and tell us about the ev evolution of that phrase and how it had an impact. Look, we'd come up with that before we'd actually finished designing the jacket. We like, yeah. we just really want it to have a, a label on one side that says, take care of your jacket and the wash instructions on, on, the, care label. The, on the care yeah. label. On the other side, it says, take care of yourself. And just some just a few light hearted nice pointers. Yeah. Some personal washing instructions. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it's just something lighthearted, and yeah, that kind of just really blew up. Yeah, uh, what happened? Who was it, Zoella? Yeah. Oh yeah, she did share. Fuck actually. Jerry, like so many. It, it was. We did forget to put. Well, we didn't forget. We actually purposefully <laughs> decided not to put our our logo, or well, not just our logo, oh, but our brand name on it. So <laughs> it, it really did blow up in lockdown, and not much of that came back to us, which is also an asset. I remember on Instagram, I was like, you know, yeah, I remember, yeah the the picture of the um, yeah, the care label, yeah, was was everywhere, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Oh my yeah. gosh, I spent so many hours in lockdown, like viciously trying to like <laughs> comment on these posts, like, please, can you tag and credit painter? <laughs> and people would take it and they change it, turn it into different languages, or they try and copy copy exactly because they saw it was going viral yeah a friend of mine was actually in a design that. meeting at reformation and she said it came up on their screen as we're going to make our version of this and she put her hand up and said please don't that's that's a really that's small company that's my friends in the uk um yeah. but no doubt that yeah we we did change it shortly afterwards um we just what, does it, what does it say now each one is different so it yeah. might be about working on an idea or okay. um we did a massive one in lockdown didn't we like the biggest curly yeah. we've ever done it was all a poem about sense of place and it was actually handwritten and scanned in so we just have a lot of fun with them and change them each time and it's that surprise and delighting element that so many brands force and it comes across as crass or naff or, or forced exactly yeah and you seem to do this effortlessly when you're making these decisions as to what to write on the label or how to communicate is it is it like Becky? Are you coming up with the idea, and he's going that that's thumbs up or thumbs down? What? How does the process work? Oh, it really changes each time. Yeah, definitely. Um, we'll often talk about an idea for a label quite far out, um, okay. and perhaps say, "Oh, when we work with like the next one, should I say it or not?" Mm, I don't know. Should I? Tell us oh, about yeah. one that already exists. Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, I don't think, sometimes we have a theme for a batch. For example, yeah. when we did the apple cross jacket in 2020 um the theme for that one was creative resilience and okay. so like the design that we give a brief to the, the pushing through barriers to get the job done yeah you get the best work out of yourself and the... so the label that was designed for the um limited edition label and the print that came with it was all around that and then so was the care label and they all, link like they all kind of link in people we don't tell people this we know this it's an internal thing but we try and just make sure there's a theme of something going yeah. on it's almost like little clues isn't it in a treasure hunt that people can pick up slowly over time rather than it all being shouted at them i love it yeah. um and then on the on the kind of branding and building journey, what's what's been hard? Like um, you mentioned that initial backlash on your second batch. Um, yeah. what, what else have been the real challenges over the last couple of years for you? I think most of the challenges are in the manufacturing space, um, mm. particularly at the moment, um, from constant challenges on timings. Um, we're hearing it from absolutely every type of business, like mm. 
my mum and dad run a garden centre and they are constantly talking about the delays in garden furniture. And mm. we're talking about the exact same delays with jackets and it'll, and it'll be the same in food. Um, Brexit seriously didn't help, but then gas prices, electricity prices, all of that is all adding to delays and difficulties for manufacturing. Um, so the way that we face that challenge is then taking that information and, and educating our customers and still trying to keep things positive, mm -hmm. but also having to be realistic because there's nothing we can do and we all have mm -hmm. to understand the pressures um, on our manufacturers. So we, when we make a jacket every single week throughout the making process, we have a friend, Vitor, who's over in Portugal and he'll head up to the factory on his bike and he'll film exactly what's happening that week with your jacket and send us an edit and then we'll send it on to our customers. So we kind of navigated that that long wait time and turned it into a positive so that people really understood exactly mm. how their jackets And, and it's such a great way of, I mean, as Andy was saying up front, it's something he really loves about um following along and being a customer because mm -hmm. it, it when, when you've most of the problems that we have in life are because we don't understand or we're ignorant or we misunderstand yeah and so so being able to explain it and show oh here's why we're delayed here's mm -hmm. why we're changing this or doing that and as yeah. long as you're, you're still being honest about it then it's kind of like okay yeah Here and sometimes go. there's like some funny mistakes that happen batch two is a funny one so we had designed it um, the top pocket to have a little end pocket stitching stitch in and and then at the last minute we decided do you know what we're going to take the pen pocket out we had a lot of back and forth on whether mm. it was right or not and then during production um, in the factory the one lovely lady who was on the machine who was sewing on the pot the pockets she actually had an old sample sat next to her to reference and it had a pen pocket on so we heard at the end of the day that um not just did one or two pockets have pen pockets, but actually all 300 did. And we had already explained exactly why we'd taken that out. <laughs> the design and, decision of why. And so then we just recorded a video to our customers. It was like tiny little things. It was just yeah. a little video to our customers to be like, we've actually got the pen pockets now. And everyone responded like, that's my favorite thing about this jacket now, because mm. they kind of, they felt involved, um, even with the mistakes. And they have a story to tell in the pub. They're like, yeah, yeah. No, you see, you see? Yeah, yeah wasn't that wasn't no, planned. Yeah, I think there's like so many people ask us, like, oh, how do you decide what to say in your newsletter on Instagram or mm -hmm. all that sort of customer communication? And then we just go, right, what's the truth? Always, yeah. And let's tell that. Let's not try to fabricate anything because people want to uh, support people. And if we're honest about yeah. like what's going on, good or bad, I, we believe that they'll support us. And so if we tell them about Buckets as well as I was said, like the good things you do. That's like, oh yeah, they're human. They're not perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. You re you remind me so much of, um, or they remind me of you. Um, uh, Unplugged is this you off off grid cabins business, and and oh, yes. uh, they're doing this brilliant job. You think, okay, it's the same. Like you guys from the outside, oh, it's the same type of jacket. I know they're different shape, but from the like, if you're not in it, it's just like one yeah. four yeah. times a year. They're like the same cabins and in the woodland and they're beautiful views. But but the content around them, like the way you're doing and, and what they do really well is they talk about the reality of, you know, what it's like to get these cabins live and the kind of mixed, you know, when they get an extreme bit of feedback and they share it. And and it's just, I think it's that thing where you sit down and chat with a friend at the end of the week and they're like, no, no, really, how are you? Not just like, yeah, yeah I'm fine, I'm fine. And that bit that comes afterwards, that second answer is your yeah. kind of content marketing strategy. And it's it's mm. clearly working. Yeah, like that. Yeah. 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 Um, so. and let's talk about slow fashion briefly, or not briefly, slowly. <laughs> so this world that you're now very much part of, um, where how do you feel about it all? Because we see the headlines in the news every day about another fast fashion business that's uh, destroying the planet that's abusing uh you know mm -hmm. workers um that's that's lying that's cheating that's corrupt and it feels like they're all there's so much wealth do do you feel like oh we're on a mission to try and change that and but we're only doing it so slowly it's going to take 30 years or do you go mm -hmm. actually we don't we're just going to ignore that we're going to focus on what we do really well do you yeah. care about like what goes on beyond painter uh we don't ignore it because it's definitely it's definitely the enemy. The enemy is like the 
exactly as you just described and the, the, yeah the, the, the shames or whatever right. you say whatever you say the name the instagram hauls and the the vast amount of wasteful shopping um we also know that we alone definitely can't change that mm. but we can do a mm. damn good job at trying um and we think the more that we open up the reality of how something is made um the more likely people are to change the way that they shop. And I think the best thing we ever get from our customers is an email. And it, it's an email that get, get quite a lot when their jacket arrives and they say, actually, I thought I was hoping it would be really nice um, because my friends had told me about it, but it's so much better than I thought. And mm. I really wanted to ask if you could, if you know of any other brands doing this for trousers, socks, shoes, uh, et cetera, because I don't want to buy in the way that I used to buy. I really want to do this for everything that I own. And I want to know about the roots of everything in my wardrobe. And that's I think that's the, the best feedback we ever get. And even though it's a small scale, if it does change customer behavior and people do buy even a jacket as a gift for someone to help spread that message rather than having lots themselves, then it all does add up. Um, and there are, I think people's bullshit raiders are, very very strong now mm -hmm. um so it's it's not going to be a good time for big companies trying to pull the wool over people's eyes so to speak and launch a sustainable collection for one percent of their collection when yeah you see that, you see that bit in the corner that's conscious whereas 99 yes. percent is unconscious it's terrible. Yeah. yeah it's wild isn't it yeah. i i love that i love that sort of um thinking about how you're shifting mindset around not just mm. i'm sure it goes beyond wardrobe as well which is like how mm. what else can i spend money on or or how else can i live that's going to decisions i make last for 30 years like this jacket yeah. um not just for the you know 30 minutes or 30 days um for what i'm wearing you know, the what is a sustainable brand mm. because you think of sustainable brand and you think for some reason hemp comes into mind all that like brown socks. yeah and itchy and it's just <laughs> like why can't a sustainable brand have the same kind of excitement as something like a supreme and they have people queuing around the corner mm. so like what if you can try and build that excitement around something that's slightly more sustainable or they do it in a sustainable way yeah like why can't we try and do that yeah and I think everyone who comes to like a small brands, you can't do everything. Like you have to pick your lane, right? We're gonna be good at this. We're gonna really focus on minimizing waste. We're gonna make to order. And we're gonna give the best damn experience you've ever had mm -hmm. buying a clothes. You'd be like, I don't know, hopefully by the end of the thing, oh my God, and like, what have I bought? Um, mm -hmm. So it's just like, we kind of have to focus on that. Cause it, again, it is the two of us and Esther and her help. Yeah. <laughs> And I love that kind of reframing of hype for quality as, to, as as opposed to hype for crap, which is what we live. We live in a world that's hyping crap, right? Rather than celebrating and really enjoying quality, which is the story you've told so well. Um, yeah. Sam from from MYO, which is a brilliant creative studio for adults and, and play space in London, wants to know mm -hmm. what a typical working week looks like for the both of you. Yeah. So how do you how do you work together? I'm sure it's changing a lot, but um, over time. But what does it look like? it's so varied because we don't really work with any agencies and we only have Hester's help it, we have to do all of the things involved <laughs> which um it Probably could mean a brain dump on monday oh yeah brain dump every morning just be like, <laughs> yeah. what are ev what's everything in our heads that is fizzing away stressing us exciting us what do we have to do versus what do we really want to do mm -hmm. um and then we'll kind of go through those and be like okay so what should we do now um is there a good time for that or then you know is that a next week thing um and then we'll put an h and a b next to everything or both <laughs> <laughs> decide who's going to do what um i feel like it's one long conversation yeah but always we we don't have very divided roles we there are certain things that will lean more towards Hugh is so fanatical about jacket details it's amazing like you could be still researching a particular stitching on a denim jacket late on a Sunday night because you just love it and it's something you've mm. seen that was only done on a denim jacket between 1962 and 1964 and you know about it and so you're yeah. putting all of that love into jackets and and into products and I'm probably as fanatical on the people side of things. So we both have our niches. Yeah. But then a lot of the things like the narration and the storytelling and the 
planning photography, planning next batches, talking to factories, all of those things we share. Um, but it might be if someone writes something, then the other one edits. Yeah. And often. it goes back and forth, back and yeah. forth, back and forth. Because sometimes we, you'll have loads of ideas and I'll have none, and then sometimes it's the other way around. So we'll just figure that out. But yeah. I think what it's, it's, it's reminding me of is in team, obviously we're not all doing this with our life partners, but uh, we are very close, aren't we, in co-founding teams? It's a bit like a, a different kind of marriage, isn't it? Um, yeah. And uh, it, it's actually just being com just being open and comfortable with each other's, like, not just their interests and passions, but what they bring to the table. I think sometimes we're too quick in startups to say, right, chief marketing officer, which is bullshit, yeah. by the way, because it's like chief of what? <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. Um, and like creating these labels, whereas actually let's just figure out as we go. And of course, over time, you'll be in a team, I'm sure, that's bigger in the future. You have mm -hmm. to figure out the roles a bit more. But so let's let's just as we as we wrap up this conversation, talk about the future. What's next for Painter? Um, there's a couple of questions coming in. Like, do you plan to grow, and what does growth look like? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, what's com what's coming down the line? Um, what does growth look like? Growth look like um, it's quite a funny one because the last two years have been so weird in like yeah. with the pandemic that we don't know what normal looks like we didn't when we when we went into lockdown we had no year being full time to compare anything to so that yeah. was making it up as we went along and then now is comparing to lockdown years which are they're really really different i, I think across across category yeah we they probably scale down um we had we were really lucky to come through lockdown and to come through it well we we're lucky that we made products that are very visible on Zoom. Um, <laughs> and lucky that we weren't in the travel industry. I yeah. think clothing and homewares actually did quite well, because especially mm. with brands that had communities that were loyal and, and kind to them, which we were. Um, so we're not really looking to grow this year. I think it would be unrealistic to try mm. and do that. We're more looking to stay afloat always, yeah. aren't we? It's just making sure that it's like, I think there's, a sweet spot to every business and we're just trying to find that sweet spot where we can continue to deliver the, like really good personal service because of a great product and a really great experience yeah like, because you always hear of brands when they like they they've nailed that and then they get to a certain point where you start to hear whispers of oh um product's not as good as it used to be yeah oh, this isn't as good as it used to be their, their voice is totally off now mm. like yeah okay let's just keep a pulse and like where that sweet spot is and i think it's okay you don't have to constantly go up and to the right it can go up and down up and down but around the sweet spot yeah and i was just trying to figure out where that is and of and, course it grows with you doesn't it as the as the leaders of the business so as you mm -hmm. evolve and grow as humans the kind of business goes with you and that and the brand can shift with it right totally yeah, yeah. it's like people want know. to grow in terms of quality always yeah. like we've only been around for three years and with every single jacket we make. Well, we're only on batch, we've just made batch 11. So it's not actually very much when you look at Mr. Porter's sale with like 54,000 items. <laughs> um, <laughs> we have, we we go with every batch that we make and every factory partner that we work with, we learn so much and also with every fabric mill. So I think we're always trying to like, take the lessons of the previous batch to the next and increase quality more and more and more. And, I think the happier our customers are with their jackets, then the more people they will tell. Um, so, yeah, yeah, growth, I think, definitely has to look at quality yeah. and experience and, as well as just numbers, for sure. And for the future, just constantly trying to educate people on how we work because, oh, yeah. because you know, we understand how we work. People mm. who have been with us for three years know how we work. But... The guy walking down the street or the girl walking down the street right now have no idea how we work. And if you start to explain, it takes a while to explain. Yeah. Uh, when you make, like this time, you, if you have going to a website now, you can't buy anything. Mm -hmm. Why is that? And like, what do you believe in? And there's a lot to communicate. Yeah, it's a challenge. Um, there's, there's a, it's a quite a long time until you actually get into it and you go realize, oh, okay, I get it now. Yeah. And people even be with this for maybe three years still don't quite get all of it, but. Yeah. yeah well we've been with you for 45 minutes and i feel like we've got we've learned so much i'm going to take <laughs> sally sally fox's question as our last one which is about the influences on you so so hugh we heard at the start you know background with with her at denim and in your textile 
background, Becky, that obviously brought you initially together mm. on this journey. Um, but in, in terms of the truth telling around your content, which is like a sort of strong theme, I think, from your story so far, have there been brands that you've been very aware of or even people that have kind of helped you you take take inspiration from or are there are there brands today that you're like oh we love what they're doing and we just mm. admire them or we're taking ideas and oh maybe more people wise, yeah of like you see people who really like can communicate so so well mm. and you think instead of looking at brands that communicate well because normally they're like big brands and it's like oh we don't sound like a big brand we sound like a human it's not like us um mm, yeah. so like let's take inspiration from people instead of brands I think we all also always wanted to look outside of our own industry for mm. inspiration because um, our industry is full of people doing things the same way and we didn't want to operate in the same way. So we, uh, there's all sorts of things at the start, especially like um, when you look on your phone at software updates, you'll see all the, the um, design updates that designers have taken great consideration to make that uh, product or the app better. And so we would look at something like that and be like, oh, why didn't you get software updates for like a jacket? And so we'd make something called batch notes. And it was literally just like a stream of consciousness and all of the decisions that went into making a product better. Um, that was one. Another one. Another and how video. did you, so the, the, on the batch notes, Becky, how did you then mm -hmm. package that and communicate it? Was it just like in a newsletter or do you do it, was it in different ways? Post, um, okay. But then, yeah, it was like a newsletter would, would, mm point people to the fact that that's been updated. And then we practically put it into print. Oh, we did actually, yeah. So when it came, we did it for about two the first time. And so we put it all in print so people could see all the updates. We even mentioned like the day we paid our photographer for the shoot. Yeah, so random It's just stuff, like all but... things that we would do. So that's in there. It's yeah. like, if like, I don't know, when you go on BBC News and there's a football game or something live mm. and you just get the constant updates. Yeah. True. And there's a timestamp and it's like, Great. You don't, you don't need much. It's not like in depth. It's just like, does it happen? Yeah. It's when things happen. But it's again, it's this behind the scenes thing that people are like, oh, what's the truth behind this business yeah. or these people? Mm. And yeah, we feel closer. And we live in this influencer world, don't we now, where TikTok is the most disruptive media brand on the planet right now, apparently. Yeah. Um, and yet it often feels at least from my point of view, a lot of startups and small businesses are trying to be this very polished version of themselves yeah. because they're selling, they're trying to sell a really quality product. And that's, and, and they get stuck with this tension between we're selling something at a decent price point that, that is really good quality, but at the same mm -hmm. time, we, we don't, we haven't got the marketing budget. So mm -hmm. you've, you seem to have found this middle path that works, that works really well. There's, um, there's the thing of like, uh, I remember when we were starting up, and we always see that, right, big brands are trying to look small, small brands are trying uh, to look big. Yeah. Let's try and look exactly how we are. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's just like, if, you could, if we can try and hit that sweet, sweet spot, and it comes back to like, what do we talk about? The truth. Let's just be as honest as possible. Let's not try and dress us up in to be really, really fancy because if you met us in person, we're not fancy. Yeah, giant letdown. <laughs> <laughs> we're, just, we're just like, I don't know. Yeah. It's just. Yeah. So, fi so final truthful uh, answer then tonight. If mm -hmm. if those watching are like, I really, really want a painter jacket, can they come to you directly and uh, pay four times the price and get a guaranteed <laughs> sale? We don't have any stock. <laughs> and my mother has to wake up at nine a.m. on a Saturday and buy a jacket and pay full price. Oh, we've really <laughs> I know. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. You get. They are. They are definitely not tempted by the uh, the, the old capitalist <laughs> model. <laughs> Um, it's yeah. it's so as I was expecting. Really, uh, you know, I'd heard about your stories through people like Andy and seeing, you know, seeing bits and pieces on social media over the last three years. But um, it's it's so much more engaging and inspiring than I was anticipating. Um, even though I had high expectations, talking to you both, and I, it sounds like your products would do exactly the same thing for your customers. So, thank you for giving us your time this evening. Wow. And. And yeah, and, and this story will go out to, to more and more people who will get on the wait list and try wow. their best to get a jacket. <laughs> um, 
Thank but you. Yeah, so I, much. I, I, no, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure having you. And I really hope that this slow, the slow fashion movement, like very deliberate, it catches on far. You know, much, oh, there's so many great startups out there doing stuff. Um, yeah. So we, we just want everyone to move in this direction for people and planet, and also a happier life and this more stylish one as well <laughs> uh becky and hugh thank you so much for being with us and uh, all the best for the next batch thank oh, you so much thanks ben bye have a good, have good evening. evening cheers <laughs> <laughs>